I want to talk to you today about the life-changing power of the Word of God. And to get us started, let's remind ourselves about what is the gospel. My definition of the gospel is this, that God wants to invade earth and transform it into Eden to make it a little bit more like heaven. He does this by transforming you into the kind of person who can count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. And that, of course, is a quote from James 1, 2, that God will enable you to count it all joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. You can become a kind of person like Paul who learned to be content in any and every situation. Then God wants to make you into the kind of person who gets up every day and says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy, O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. So he wants to transform us into the kind of person who can count it all joy whenever we face trials of many kinds. And then he wants to transform us into instruments of his peace who will each one make our world, our little world first, and then our bigger world second, into a world that is more like heaven. Well, how does he do that? We looked last week at the verse that says, train yourself to be godly. And we looked at the idea that training is breaking down an impossible task, the impossible task of making you like Jesus into possible tasks and repeating those possible tasks until they become easy. And that was the topic of last week's session. This week, we're going to look at the message of James 1, 121. We're going to look at Psalm 119 in a moment, but the message of James 121, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly except the word planted in you, which can save you. And I remind you that that word save in the Bible means more or less help. In this context, I I would say it means that he transforms us. The word planted in you can transform you. It can help you. It can change you. I watched the Spider-Man movie the other day. In fact, I didn't actually watch it. I was watching it with my uh, grandbabies and uh, they were watching it and I was sitting on the the couch and I was, it was turned down a little bit. I couldn't hear all that well. So I didn't follow it all that well, but there was one particular scene. I think I understood what was going on with a spider bites uh, Spider-Man. And then it goes into this graphic where it shows the inside of his body being transformed. And I thought, you know, that is a picture of what the word of God is in you, that it gets inside of you and it gets in your soul and it transforms you. And we want to talk today about how that happens. So we're going to read our passage today, looking for the answer to the question, how does God's word transform us? Whenever you read the Bible together as a group, you always want to give them something to look for. And the something we want to look for this week is how does the word of God transform us? So let's read our passage with that question in mind. Be good to your servant while I live that I may obey your word. What do we learn about how God's word transforms us from that verse right there? Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. What do we learn from that verse about how God's word gets inside us and transform us? I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all time. You rebuke the arrogant who are accursed, those who stray from your commands. Remove from me their scorn and contempt, for I keep, I keep your statutes. What do we learn about how God transforms us from that verse right there? Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate, will meditate. What do we learn about how God transforms us from that word right there? Meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. What do we learn about how God transforms us from that passage? And here's my first observation. The word changes us. It transforms us through exposure. I went up and took a hike last week in northern New Mexico, what they call the Badlands up there. And I saw this rock formation and posted it on Facebook. And somebody said, how did that happen? How did that get to be formed like that? And I think, and I said, I think water was involved. I think maybe there was a whole lot of water at some point on planet Earth. And through exposure to that water, that rock formation was formed. And in a similar way, in exposure to the Word of God, we are transformed. The Bible says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And you want to continually show your people that the meaning of the passage is the message of your lesson. The meaning of the passage is the message of your lesson. You want to draw your points. You want to draw your application right out of the message itself. 
Now, why would he need to pray this? Why would he need to pray, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things from your law? Why don't he just read the law and see it? Well, the reason is the Bible teaches that we are blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And to some degree, we stay blinded unless God opens our eyes on a continual basis. The minds of the unbeliever blinded the eyes of the unbelievers so that they cannot see. They cannot see and we cannot see unless God daily opens our eyes, the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. And in our state without God, this is how we are. Luke 24, 15, the story of the men on the road to Demaeus may or may not be men. It may be a couple. We're not sure. But anyway, has another talk, talk for another day. Uh, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And we will be kept. We are often kept from recognizing the truth of the Word of God. And a few verses later, we see what happened to them, and we want this to happen to us. We pray that it happens to us. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized Him, and then He disappeared from their sight. And so we are changed by praying the prayer, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. We expose ourselves to God's Word with an understanding that unless God opens our blind eyes, it won't do us any good. No matter how much you pray, no matter how much you read the Word, no matter how much time you spend in the Word, unless God opens your eyes and mine, we will not be able to see. Now, another observation here is you can't force yourself to see. You can't force your blind eyes to see, but you can put yourself in a position where it just might happen. And as you know, I love to hike it. I love to hike this one particular canyon I've, I've fallen in love with, Achenbach Canyon. And the reason is six times I've seen an oryx out there. And I just love the, those beasts. And the truth be told, I've hiked out there maybe a hundred times and I can't make myself see those oryx. I can't, if you were to come out to New Mexico and you were to say to me, Josh, I want you to take me on my, the, one of those hikes and I want you to show me that, that, that orcs. I'd say to you, I'm not sure that I can. I can show you where they sometimes are. I can show you where I've seen them in the past. I can get myself in a position. And if you came with me, I could get you in a position where we might could see them, but we can't force ourselves to see them. And so it is with the word of God. We can get ourselves in a position where we open the word of God and we pray and we ask God to open our eyes, but we can't force it to happen. We need God's grace to cause our, our blinded eyes to see. So observation number one, the word changes us through exposure. Observation number two, the word changes us through med meditation. The message of the lesson is the meaning of the passage. The meaning of the passage is the message of the lesson. So here is our verse coming right out of our passage. Your servant will meditate on your decrees. So let's chat a little bit about meditation. As you know, my pattern is on Sunday to expose myself to the next week's passage. And then on Monday, I try to find what is the big idea. And then oftentimes I'll download an audio book. And this week I downloaded the audio book, God's Battle uh, Plan for the Mind. I don't always finish them. I happen to f uh, finish the, this one. And he's got a number of great quotes uh, that deal with meditation coming from the Puritans. A Christians enter into meditation as a man in enters into the hospital that he may be healed. Meditation heals the soul of its deadness and earthliness. Little meditation makes lean Christians. You ever feel like we have lean Christians? You ever feel like the Christians today are a little bit lean? The Puritan said that little meditating makes lean Christians of little life, little strength, little growth, and little usefulness to others. And if you want to make strong Christians, if you want to be a strong Christian, you want to spend much time in meditating on God's Word. The Puritan meditative tradition is the is the supreme means of grace. And so we want to challenge our people to meditate on God's Word. A couple of classic verses on this. Joshua 1, 8, keep this book of the law always on your lips, always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. In Psalm 1, blessed is a man who does does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law, what's that next word? He meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers because he meditates on God's word. 
Meditation is celebrated not only by the Puritans and not only by the Bible itself. Modern science has discovered, and here's one article from Forbes, and uh, the title is Seven Ways Meditation Can Actually Change Your Brain. And uh, way number one is meditation helps preserve the aging brain. You ever feel like your aging brain is getting not quite as good as it was? The solution, according to Forbes, and I would say according to the Bible, and according to the Puritans, is to spend time meditating on God's Word. Meditation reduces reduces the activity in the brain's me center. Well, that's good news right there. Its effects rival antidepressants for depression and anxiety. Meditation may lead to volume changes in key areas of the brain. The good parts of your brain are actually going to get to be bigger. Just a few days of training improves concentration and attention. Meditation reduces anxiety and social anxiety. Meditation can help with addiction. Short meditation, even short meditation breaks can help kids in school. And so the Bible and modern science agree that meditation is good for you, and we ch- we are changed through exposure to the wa- Word of God and to meditation on, on the Word of God. And let me say that there's a big difference. When the, when the secular science talks about meditation, generally speaking, they're talking about Eastern meditation, and there's a big difference between Eastern meditation and Christian meditation, and the difference is essentially this. Eastern meditation is about emptying your mind. Christian meditation is about filling your mind. It's about meditating on the truth of God's Word, and there's something about meditating on the truth of God's word that will change you. But there's one more thing. We're th- changed through exposure. We're changed through meditation. And thirdly, we're changed through application. And again, the meaning of the passage is the message of your lesson. And so wh- what does the passage say? The passage says, be good to your servant while I live that I may obey your word, not just be exposed to your word and not just meditate on your word, but that I may obey your word. Manton said it well, whatever you meditate on must be drawn down to application. While we stay in generals, while we stay in vague ideas about scripture is what he's saying there, while we stay in generalities, we might put it today, while we stay in generalities, we do not but bend the bow. When we come to application, we let the arrow fly and we hit the mark. All of the good of meditating on scripture comes from applying the scripture. As Paul aptly wrote, application is the life of meditation. Application is the life of meditation. So here's the big idea I want you to close with. Application is not only the objective of discipleship, it is the objective of discipleship, but in addition to being the objective of discipleship, application is the means of discipleship. What do we mean by that is, we mean by that you become a giving person by giving. You never become a giving person by studying giving. You can memorize every verse in the Bible on giving, and I would encourage you to memorize a bunch of them, and it's a good thing, and you can meditate on those words, and you can do Greek word studies on on the Greek words and Hebrew word studies on the, on the Hebrew words, and that's all well and good. But eventually, you've got to put something in the plate. You've got to take something out of your wallet and give it to somebody else because it is in doing, it is in doing that you are changed, not only in reading, not only in exposing yourself, not only in meditating, not only in study, but it is in doing. Application is not only the objective of of discipleship, application is the means of discipleship. Application is not only the objective of discipleship, it is the means of discipleship. You become a serving person, not by reading about serving, not by meditating on serving, not by thinking about serving, not by doing Greek word studies on serving. You become a serving person by serving. You want to challenge your people this week. What are you going to do about what you heard today? Get out and do something. Even something very small will change your heart. You become a grateful person by giving thanks, not just by doing Greek word studies, but by actually engaging in the activity of gratitude. So how does God change us? He changes us through exposure to the word of God. And we would pray, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things from your law. He changes us through meditation on the word of God by thinking about and pondering and considering and dwelling on the word of God. And ultimately he changes us as we obey the word of God, as we take action on what we have read. And may God richly bless you as you teach these life transforming truths from the word of God to your people this week.